Welcome to Deep Weird Dialogues with me, Dr. Jack Hunter. I'm talking to contributors to the book Deep Weird about their chapters um, and some of the ideas that are contained within them. And today I'm here with Barbara Fisher from the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast. And she has a chapter in here with Dr. Christopher Diltz uh, called Creating Project Hera. So I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about what Project Hera is. Well, it's it's actually a computer database that right now includes uh, Albert Rosales's humanoids encounters, humanoid encounters database, which is more than the 17 books worth that he's had published. It's so much information. And I read his books and they were really cool, but because of the way that he wrote them, it's a lot of data, but there's no way to coordinate it or, you know, compare and contrast or, you know, I mean, I even thought about putting up a bulletin board with a map and then all the pins and all the yarn in the world and, and look like, like the crazy conspiracy person. But I was like, it's too much for that. So, you know, I started taking post-it notes and then, you know, about one packet worth of post-it notes later, I was like, wait a minute, this is like the 21st century. Why am I doing it this way? And the, the real reason why was because I can't build a database that's searchable. I have no idea how to do this, but I do know people who do. And so I... Uh, invited Chris over for pasta bolognese and whatever else he might want for dinners later and talked him into it, which wasn't that hard. So he's building a natural language processing database that looks at all of the Word documents that Albert sent us, which is, and he keeps updating. So it's a lot, many, many pages. And what that means is, is the computer can read it and look for keywords. Um, it makes it sound way more simple than what Chris actually had to do. He had to translate Word documents into, into I'm going to go into wah, 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 um, JSONs and then all of that. See, and it, it's taken me like, a year and a half to actually understand. I had to like understand this to write the paper. So, so he kind of beat it into my head and then went through and corrected and he wrote his part. But basically we're putting it together so that it can become public on a website and researchers can get in there and it'll work like Google. You, you put in keyword searches and it'll pop out with with it if you want your data to be presented to you in a list in links or whatever it can do that it can also this is the more exciting uh phenomena we can we can make it do is we can make it um display on a map mm -hmm. and we can have it in charts and we can have time and geography together at the same time yeah. so you can look up what happened in Ohio as far as humanoid encounters in 1958. And then you'll get that and then you can say, put it on a map and you know, boom, it'll have it on a map. Uh, you can ask for certain criteria like um, humanoid encounters that include a UFO presence or an anomalous light. Mm -hmm. You can look up just Bigfoot, you can look up winged humanoids, you can, you can you can do all the things. Sounds so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And presumably you could use it to look for, you, obviously you could use it to look for patterns across um, different experiences and different regions, but you could yes. also use it to explore things that other researchers have commented on. So like John Keel, for example, and his uh, thing about UFOs and Wednesdays, is it? Right. They're mo most common on a Wednesday. So if you had a, a database like this, then you would be able to sort of test these kinds of hypotheses. Yes. Yes. Um, in the very first testing that that we did with it, uh, Chris was like, I'm just going to, you know, ask for 
the numbers of encounters per year from like 1945 to present day. And so he, he said, okay, so there are these peaks and valleys. Let's explore, you know, what's happening at these times. So he's like, how many of these years were UFO flaps? Were they pre prevalent? And, and it followed the flap years. Yeah. He, he was kind of shocked that I knew them by, you know. Already knew them. Yeah. He just started, you know, 1972. Yes, that was a smaller flap. 1967. Yes, yes, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, and he said, and then in Puerto Rico in 1994, there's a huge, I went Chupacabra. Yeah. It was Chupacabra. <laughs> very cool interesting he then then he went through and we both talked because even though he's a computer scientist and a physicist he has a, a an amazing uh memory for history and he he really likes history i i thought he was a phd in history when i first met him but um, he went through and we were like okay so here is the cuban missile crisis and, and you know over here in this big chunk is the fall of the USSR. So it it follows all sorts of patterns and, and you can derive useful ideas at least from what you see. Yeah, it's brilliant. I think it's a really fruitful endeavor and I applaud you for you know pulling it off. It's amazing. I can see the applications for other possible, you know, other databases like the Religious Experience Research Center database, yes. which has got 6,000 religious experiences in it, but a very clunky mechanism for trying to search them. So. Yeah, yeah. And I actually thought of that too, because I'm I'm uh, currently working on a book about anomalous light phenomena. And I have uh, several books that reference that database. Yeah. And, you know, one book, pulled out something like I don't know a hundred and something um experiences that were written you know uh that were contributed by the experiencers but I was like there's six thousand I know I know there's more in there exactly. <laughs> I know <laughs> yeah, I think this is this could be a really fruitful avenue for anomalous experience research to you know use databases like this in a way that hasn't really been possible in the past so certainly not publicly yeah, exactly. um, there are private databases um, that are put together in a very similar way. But, you know, one of the things about anomalous research or anomaly research or any paranormal, whatever you want to call it, it everybody's kind of like, I don't know, stingy with their data. They, they don't like share it. Now, I know there have, there are reasons because I know that people have stolen data from other people and taken credit for the work. And I do understand that. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that we still really need to just share our information as much as possible. Like eventually we want to get the public databases for um, Bigfoot sightings, uh, Chupacabra sightings, uh, UFO sightings. Uh, ghost sightings is interesting because that's there's no database for that anywhere that I have found on the internet for, you know, I saw a ghost, it was here, it was there. Interesting. There's ghost lights, but not ghosts. Um, so I'd like to see that happen and put it all together and then see what happens. Yeah, to get as big a picture as possible. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you very much for that. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, if you, anyone is interested in checking out Barbara's chapter with uh, Dr. Christopher Diltz, it's in Deep Weird. Um, do check it out. It's very interesting stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah.